thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, as was mentioned, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and then what I'm going to do is hopefully tell you a bit more about building on the themes introduced already, how HR can really influence, both through influencing skills and relationship building, but also through the use of data and metrics. So, as was mentioned, I've worked for various brands over the years, 20-something years of experience, longer than I care to remember in HR. Uh, mainly worked internationally, um, mainly often in Europe, but also in far-flung places like Australia, uh, South Africa, and Azerbaijan. I'm not quite sure what I did to deserve that one. Um, the reason why, I guess, giving you this background is important is that I think it's really helpful in your career to work across different industries and across different businesses. Um, the great thing for me about HR is that it's a transferable skill set. So actually, as long as you can get into an organization, understand the key drivers, it doesn't matter whether it's selling drywall insulation like we do in SIG right now. We probably supply some of the walls, ceilings and floors in this building. Or if it's mobile phones like EE was, uh, the key thing is to get into that business, understand the key drivers and then apply the experience and knowledge that you've got. SIG is a FTSE 250 business. Just to give you a feel for size and scale, our revenue is about 2.6 billion, which puts us in, in the FTSE 250. We operate across 11 countries, and it's a really nice number. It's 10,000 people. I have done roles outside of uh, SIG previously where I've had a bigger number. One of the biggest I had was 80,000 people with Circle PLC, and they're very different animals. And I thought some of the comments that were made earlier around choosing which organization you work for and identifying what's important to you are key because big organizations are a bit like trying to move an oil tanker. Smaller organizations are a bit like being a rowing boat with some holes in the bottom, and mid-sized organizations are probably somewhere in between. So it's something that I didn't think about when I studied and moved on into HR. I kind of fell into HR, and I think a lot of people do that. Um, but it is important to think about what kind of company are you interested in? What sort of size and scale appeals to you? Do you want to be a big fish in a small pond or a smaller fish in a big pond? What is important around development, around work-life balance and around the sorts of places that you want to work? A retail business, for example, is very different from a B2B business, which again is very different from the public sector or from a charity. So in thinking about that and considering where you want to build your career, be mindful of it because it's something that I don't think people give you much advice around uh, when you are coming through university. So we're a big supplier of construction products. Um, we, we do supply floors, roof ceilings, carpets, you name it, we supply it. But our idea is to be specialists. And one of my key roles is keeping that differentiation within SIG and helping our people become the best that they can be to give technical advice, to provide that specialist knowledge, and to make sure that we're one step ahead of the competition. Um, so hopefully, between the roles I've done before and my current position, I'm a little bit qualified to talk to you on the subject of HR adding value today. I think there are four key things that you really need to think about in terms of having impact with HR. And one of the things that really frustrates me is I often hear people saying, oh, we don't have a seat at the board, you know, finance are on the board and, and the chief exec and marketing are often on the board, but HR aren't. It doesn't actually matter whether HR are on the board or not. There are some, some things that we can do as HR professionals to make sure we get a voice and we are heard. Some of it is around increasing your impact. Absolutely, there's something about building credibility and influencing. I think key is demonstrating that you understand the business, that you've got commercial insight and that you talk the business language. And then finally, I think using data and analytics is becoming more and more important. Now, for many of you, that might be quite an uncomfortable place. People tend to go into HR because they don't want to go into finance. I don't know about you, but I got something like nine A's and one C, and the C was in maths. Hated maths with a passion, still to this day, get Excel out every time. Um, and it's not something that I was originally comfortable with. However, if you do want to progress, you have to learn to read a balance sheet, you have to understand a P&L, you have to be able to do your budgets. And if you can't, the key is to find someone who can. I think what's critical at the senior level is being able to demonstrate that understanding and at the lower level working with people who can help you and I thought a really good point was made earlier around finding people who can help you expand your knowledge, get outside your comfort zone and perhaps take on things like projects that you might not normally do. 
So that's critical, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the value wall. I think also, if you're talking about the Ulrich model, there's some new roles coming into play that didn't exist back when that original work was done. And that's the whole philosophy of having a chief operating officer for HR, having someone who looks at it from an operational perspective, looks at the metrics, the drivers, the analytics, which is coming, becoming more and more critical. So it's not a role that maybe exists in many businesses today, but the, the research shows, and if you look forwards, absolutely forward insight shows that that role is going to become more and more important. The last point I'd like to make on this slide is that all the stuff that I'm going to talk about today actually applies to an HR person, but it equally applies to anyone who's going to be part of a team. If you want to have impact, if you want to influence, and if you want to be remembered in a certain way, all the things we're going to discuss today will be useful to you, irrespective of whether you work in HR or outside. So, how can we have an influence? Well, I think you can have an influence around a few areas. Clearly, you're brought in for your knowledge and skills, but that's really a given. You're all here studying HR, you're hopefully all going to leave with flying colours and pass the course, and you're going to all be going into organisations with the same level of technical capability. So the trick is to move outside of that and think about how you can differentiate yourselves through other things, and we'll talk a bit about that. I think becoming a key member of the team is critical, and the higher up the organisation you go, of course, the more that team will change. So initially, it's probably going to be the HR team, but as you progress, it will end up being the executive team and potentially the board. I've sat on the board in several organisations, and I'm a member of the COMEX and SIG, and my job involves looking at things outside of HR. What's our strategy? Where's the business going? How are we going to shape the future direction of SIG? And often sponsoring com uh, projects, like I'm doing now, that are outside of my remit, such as e-commerce. I think you need to use um, your, your skills to build relationships, and I think building relationships becomes more and more important. And I think on top of that, using metrics and data to influence will be really helpful. So, your technical skills are a given, your business impact is key, so how do you do that? How do you not be seen as the pink and fluffy HR person? And I alluded to this earlier, but I think one of the key things that you can do here is use data. Use facts, use figures, talk the business language, describe things in terms of a cost reduction, or an efficiency improvement, or something that's going to give the business an edge. But simply being there and taking the HR, the traditional HR approach, isn't, isn't going to cut it. You really need to demonstrate your commerciality. And in my experience, there's two things that will make people change or listen to your, your ideas. It's if you can describe the benefit for them, so what's in it for me, that's what everyone wants to know, or alternatively, if you describe the consequences of either doing it or not doing it. And that can be in terms of legal risk, it can be in terms of cost to the business, it can be in terms of what it will mean for them personally. So showing the benefit and the consequences and demonstrating that for each thing that you're trying to sell into the business will be really helpful to you because without one of those two things, people don't tend to change. Why would they if you haven't given them a reason to change or a possible negative consequence of not changing? Those of you that are parents, I've no doubt if any of you in the room have got young children, you will have applied this to your children, maybe without realising it. But for kids, if they don't have the benefit or the consequence, they're going to hold steady and they will not budge. And it's the same philosophy, really, that we're talking about in business. The second thing is about understanding the business in the broader environment. A lot of the work that I do is looking at the competition in our field. What are Wolseley doing? What are Grafton's doing? What are Travis Perkins doing? How are they driving up productivity? How are they reducing costs? And I think here, this is a critical one, because if you can demonstrate the understanding of your business, you can really help them move forwards. When I worked with Circo, Circo was a large outsourced business, did a lot of work for the government. And we had a lot of people who chupied into the business. They came from existing public sector organisations. And Serco took on the contract with the aim of making it lower cost and more productive. How do you do that? When you can't do much around terms and conditions, you've got to try and really understand what will drive up productivity, what will change and make those people either better in terms of being developed and more able to do their roles, or in terms of being more productive. And in Circle, we had a real leadership challenge because in the public sector, when people moved from the public to the private sector, they weren't used to the pace of change, they weren't used to the commerciality, and many of them weren't as financially literate as we needed them to be. 
So in that business, I spent a lot of time with my chief exec looking at how did we transform leaders from the public sector into leaders for the private sector. And that was a step change in how those people operated. Some are fantastic and made it and are there to this day. Some decided they didn't want to be leaders and others left the organisation. But your role is to really help identify what is needed and then help people to get there. The other interesting thing, I think, is having the ability, as this chief exec of mine at Serca used to say, to see round corners. He said to me, Linda, have you ever watched ice hockey? And I said, no, it's not a game that I've really ever spent much time on. He said, well, you shoot. He said, because when you watch an ice hockey game, he said, the best players are the ones who can see where the puck is going. And he said, they don't move to where the puck has been. They don't even move to where the puck is. They move to where they see the puck going. He said, I need you to help me see where the puck is going. Easy, I thought, not. And part of my role was to really get up to speed with what were other companies doing, what were leading edge practices in the fields that we were looking at, and how did we help Circle be the one that could see where the puck was going. I think the other aspect that you've got to focus on is how do you really build credibility and gain trust? And this was also touched on earlier. Um, I think you know some of it is basic stuff. It's around preparing well. It's about listening well, it's about asking questions and showing an interest, and it's about actively being a part of any discussions or debates. If you show you've done your pre-reading, if you show you've got your questions ready, it demonstrates thoroughness, it will build your credibility and people will see that you're someone who's well considered and well prepared. The other thing I think which is key is doing what you say you're going to do. You've probably all been in a position where someone says to you, I'll call you back, and they never ring. And you think, ah, why bother saying you're going to call me back if you're not going to do it? So doing what you say you're going to do, building that level of, uh, demonstrating that level of integrity and building trust is critical. And there's something that I really like, and you may have done this in the theory, so if you have, forgive me, but I just want to spend a minute talking about Meister's work on the trust equation. And this is really critical. So everything above the numerator basically increases trust, and everything below that, i.e. the denominator at the bottom, decreases trust. So you want credibility plus reliability plus intimacy divided by self-orientation. So these ones at the top you want to be high and you want your self-orientation to be as low as possible because your objective should be to help the company or the person that you're dealing with. And if you get that balance right, you will gain trust. And it's interesting, it was touched on earlier again, the, the importance of the intimacy piece. So the credibility and the reliability, I think most of us get. Do what you say you're gonna do, be on time, do the right things. But what I think a lot of people miss is the intimacy piece. And um, my chief exec at Circle was hugely into to racing driving. And so a key thing that I started to watch on a Sunday afternoon was Formula One. We'll never watch the last few laps. But I watched enough to know who'd won, what happened, had there been anything exciting. And I go in on Monday morning and he'd say to me, oh, did you see the race? And I'd say, did I see the race? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and we'd have a really good chat about Formula One. And, and I quite like it now, actually. He's got me quite into it. But it is important to find something in common with the people that you're working with, to have something to talk to them about, because the more intimacy you can get, the more trust you will build. And within HR, if you think about it, it's a really privileged position. It's one of the few places where you can operate and have that access to the senior team, have those kinds of discussion with them, what's bothering you, how are things, how can I help? Um, again, cross-referencing a lot of the stuff already covered with Ted, but I think really relevant. So the trust, I think, is focusing on your leader. Don't focus on yourself. This whole self-orientation piece is critical. If you're thinking about their success, if you're thinking about how to help them, then that will absolutely help you to do that, and it will help me to build the trust. If people believe you're in it for yourself and you're only interested in what's in it for you, very quickly they see through that, and it's simply not helpful. Now, the other thing that I think is critical is finding the win-win. And, and one point that I really want to make is actually a lot of the stuff I'm talking about happens outside of meetings. So I never go into an exec meeting or a board meeting without having lobbied up front, without knowing who's, who's around that table and what their positions on my subject are, and without knowing how I can draw on the things that they've said to me to feed back into the room and build my case. So let me give you an example. 
If I'm going into a REMCOM, which is a remuneration committee to talk about pay, and I'm going to propose an increase, first thing I have to do is have all my data. What are the competition doing? What are the market rates? What's inflation doing? What's the general macro environment around pay? Then I've got to make it specific to SIG. What have we paid in the past? What should we be paying now? How's the business doing? What can we afford? But then I get into proposing the increase. Before I do that, I will have had conversations with all the people around that table. We've got a non-exec director who works for Amy. Amy, you might have heard of a big outsourcing business. He will always tell everyone around the table what Amy are doing, so I've got to find that out because if they're going higher or lower than us, that is going to influence the view around the room. So influencing outside the room and bringing in examples of things that, that are causing people pain that you can solve or bringing in examples that you know will help you are helpful. Also identifying where your gaps or your problem areas are allows you then to know what's going to come up and hopefully prepare for it. So spend as much time influencing outside the room as you do in the room. You know, have those coffees that were mentioned. I remember when I worked for EM for a business years ago called BHP Bulletin. All my boss seemed to do was go for coffee. We had this coffee area in the atrium, and every time I was coming in out the building, there he was having a coffee with someone. I used to think, I don't know what he does. All he does is have coffee. But as I progressed through my own career, I started to realize those coffees were about positioning projects, discussing things, agreeing who would support who in the room, and it's all about relationships. So critical is you know, demonstrating an understanding of people's issues feeding that back, demonstrating empathy if you can, saying, you know, I know that you're in favour of a bigger increase because you feel you've got some real issues in your division, but the finance director's view is we just can't afford that. So try and represent all the views and show that you've listened, show you've heard, and then hopefully you'll get support around the table when the decision in the meeting is actually taken. The other piece is around building influence and getting involved. And again, it is quite interesting because we hadn't seen each other's presentations, but I think there's a lot of comparisons that you can make here. Some of the best stuff you can do is get involved outside your area of expertise. So go and do a secondment, do a project, take on something that's outside your comfort zone, but absolutely do it because more and more to get that commercial understanding, it's really important. But also from the point of view of your longer term career, having worked in a function outside of HR for a period of time is hugely beneficial. When I worked with Serco, I went down and did an acquisition in India. I worked there for six months in Delhi. Um, it was an acquisition of 60 million and it was 10,000 people. And if you'd said to me a year previous to that that I was going to go and lead that project, I would have said, oh my God, I don't know how to do it. But I got thrown in, I got sent on a project management course, I came back, I did it, and it was one of the best experiences in my life. And on the basis of the work that we did, that acquisition was made, it was integrated into the business, and it gave Serco its entry into India. So if in doubt, do it. If it's scaring a little bit, that's probably quite a good thing. You need to be pushed to the side of your, the edge of your comfort zones now and again. And I would really encourage you, if there's anything in the business that you can do, whether it's from an HR perspective or outside, then do it. The other thing that I think can get lost along the way is just how important it is to network. And, and you're probably a little bit like this within the university. There are alumni, there are websites, there'll be things that you can join. But sometimes, you know, a long day in the classroom, writing stuff up in the evening, preparing for, your, for, for whatever it is you've got coming up in terms of assessments or exams, you think, oh, I can't be bothered to go and meet people. The last thing I feel like doing is going and talking to people. And it's a bit like that when you're working. You know, you put in a long day, you're in at eight, you finish at half past six, there's a networking event at seven, and you're thinking, can I be bothered to cross London to go and talk to a bunch of people that I've never met? But the value of networking is massive. First of all, because it just helps keep you up to date. So you'll talk to people that are facing similar challenges to you, might have come up with different solutions than you, and people who are working in other industries and organizations who will be really helpful to you. But playing to the point made earlier, networking is also very often how you find future work, you find your next role, you maybe find eventually a non-executive role if you're, if you're at that level. Networking is how people recommend you and how they see you and how you then can progress throughout your career. And I think Jan made a very valid point up front when she said people come back around. It's quite incredible how your paths cross time and again. And if you've made that effort, if you have a strong network, if you've got good Have I just done something? Sorry. Bounce ideas off of, then I think you'll find that really helpful. 
Also networking within the business. It's quite easy, again, just to stick with the key people that you need to work with. But building your sphere of influence and your circle of influence outside HR, I think, is critical because that's where the next role will come from. It's where the interesting projects will come from. And it's absolutely how you can leave a mark in an organisation because you'll be remembered. You've got to think about differentiating yourselves and you've got to think about your personal brand. And I think that is key. And talking of broadening relationships, I think the thing here is about thinking about how people will perceive you. And, and I thought it was a really interesting point made earlier about the difference between male and female. I went in my early career to a networking event with a, a male colleague of mine. And it was a, a champagne reception and it was a guest speaker. And we arrived there and he said to me, right, I'm all set. And he pulled out a sheet of paper and he had a list. And he'd highlighted on this list all these names and he'd made marks down the side of the, the page. And I said, and what's that? He said, well, these are the people I want to see. This is what I want to get out of it. This is why I want to see him. This is why I want to see her. And I want to pick his brains on that. And I thought, how Machiavellian. I thought, my goodness, you know, he's coming in. He's been quite mercenary. And he's going to go to that person, that person, and then he's going to leave. But actually, if you think about it, and I was going for a nice chat, I just thought I'd wander in and see who was there and have a chat and watch the speaker. And that was a real key learning for me, was the fact that actually, you need to plan. You know, you're giving up your valuable time. You've made that long journey across London. You're in this place now with all these people. You need to think about what you want from it. So the first thing about building these relationships is, you know, who do you need to target and who's going to be useful to you? And it will feel a bit Machiavellian at first, especially, I think, for the female population amongst us. But you wouldn't go into a meeting without preparing, so why would you go along to an event like this? And then secondly, once you know who you want to speak to and once you're clear what you need from them, the flip of the coin is to think about, what do I want them to think about me? When I leave the room, all these people that I've met, how do I want them to perceive me? How do I want them to remember me? What's my own personal brand and what do I want them to leave thinking or recognising about me? And again, that takes a bit of thought. So I would really advise you to network, but I would also advise you to do what I call thoughtful networking, which is why are you going to an event? Who's going to be there that's going to be useful to you? Who's going to be there that you might want to just connect with? And what impression do people leave? Um, what, what impression do you want to leave? behind you when you leave that room. The other thing about building relationships, and I think it was the point was made earlier, is you really do need to get to know people. Being an, an MD and a chief exec is a very lonely place. I would say in the past 12 to 15 years, the key people who the chief exec turns to and has historically support, had supporting him are the C, CFO and the HR director. So you're one out of two people that he can really have quite a private and, and sometimes difficult conversation with. So use that room, use that space, get to know people, their families, their interests, build personal and professional relationships, network internally and externally, and I think you'll be in a good place. Final thing on building influence um, is just about reading widely and also thinking about outside the box from an HR point of view. I don't know if you subscribe or if you all get people management or other HR magazines. If you do, that's great. But outside of that, think about the Harvard Business Review. Think about reading books. books. Um, I also loved Maverick by Ricardo Semler, but there's some other great ones out there. You know, Jack Welsh, Richard Branson. There's some fabulous books around leadership. Um, there's some great case studies, Alan Layton and others. You know, I would really encourage you to read. And if you're not a big reader and you find books off putting, there are some great websites, the TED websites, excuse the pun, uh, which summarize um, and, and give you the headlines of, of books are also really, really good. So read outside of your space, think outside of HR, and just broaden your knowledge, which will broaden your ability to have really good discussions at the senior level. I want to talk about data because I think it's a really important area. There's usually three kinds of data that you can use to help you. There's something about HR efficiency, and that's measuring things like absence, recruitment, the normal kinds of statistics that we look at. There's HR effectiveness, so that's about how do we deliver. Could be talent management, could be performance management. And then there's HR impact, and it's really the HR impact that I want to focus on today because I'm assuming that most of the companies you go into will have some measures around efficiency, and hopefully there'll be some measurement of the outcome of the HR activities around effectiveness. But HR impact, these are often strategic things, maybe around how agile your workforce is, maybe around how 
um, your, your leadership is delivering or performing. Sometimes they can be around cost effectiveness and reduction as well, but they're the key ones that will really differentiate your performance. And I think most companies gather data, but it is interesting as to what they do with the data. I think most companies have the metrics around the what. What are you doing and how are you doing it? Often that will be SLAs as well that will be in place between your shared service center and your, and your business. But I think the question is, do we really look at the HR insights that the data should give us, which is about the why? And do we think about things that drive decision making? And then finally, do we look at engagement insights and tie those into the other two? Most companies, again, do engagement surveys, but the strength in doing that is in correlating it with other things. If I think about EE, I've got a really good example from that business where Orange and T-Mobile merged. We done an engagement survey through the Sunday Times competition in Orange, and we moved into the top 25 there. We did it the following year once the two companies merged, and we moved down to 28, but still a strong position. But what we did that really demonstrated the value was we correlated the outcomes with the business results. And we took each division of our business with their engagement survey results and looked at how the two acted together. Was the financial performance up or down? If so, why? And what did that mean we had to do? And I think this is something a lot of companies miss. They have all the data, but they don't get into the insights, which then should drive your actions. And in EE, we found we had a fantastic business with high engagement scores, high performance. It was our B2B business, but we found our B2C business wasn't as strong. And we correlated that with our customer information, with our survey data, and with our financial performance. And by triangulating those three, we identified the key things we we're gonna work on for the next 12 months. So I think it can really be helpful to know not only the data, but how you turn that into insight. And it's all about adding value. And what I really like is this thing around the value wall. And the starting point with the value wall is just having your metrics. And they can be basic metrics, they can be ratios, they will be the things that your organization typically already measures. Another thing that's really helpful is benchmarks. You know, using benchmarks internally and externally can be really useful in building a business case. And again, a lot of companies will have those in place. If you're getting a bit more advanced, you're then integrating them into scorecards of some shape or form. That can be around business performance or personal performance. And you're also looking at using survey data. Most organizations operate on this side of the value wall. But the ones that are really effective at using data and the ones that really can have an impact from a business point of view, hitting the bottom line, are the ones that can break through the value wall and start to look at correlation. How do the things correlate and what does that mean? That then allows you to look at what is causing them, what's the root problem, and that can lead you then to seeing where that puck is going and prediction. When I worked again with EE, we used a company called the Future Foundation, and they were phenomenal at this stuff, and they could predict with incredible accuracy, something like 96% accuracy, the future of work, how things were going to move, and they did it through gathering a lot of data, using some very clever macros, and moving from just having the data to correlating and establishing cause to then predict. Very few companies do this. Google are pretty good at this. Their success can really be attributed in part to the fact that they've got a phenomenal data function in, in Google. And they can tell you how much revenue each employee generates. They can tell you what level of profit each employee generates. They can tell you where that comes from and they can tell you how they're going to increase it. And that all comes from using data to turn from metrics and benchmarks across to causation and prediction. And this is tough to do. If I look at SIG, I would say we're probably on this side of the value wall still. I have 11 countries, they have 11 different HR systems, they all report in a different way. It took me five months just to agree what a full-time employee was. Every business defined it differently. Whereas in EE, I would say we were moving right across to here. So whatever role you take in any business you go in to work in, Think about data and how to use it and think about how you move past that value wall uh, because I think that can really differentiate. Last thing I want to just talk about is ROI and building business cases because I think this is really important. One of my biggest surprises moving from the first organization I worked for, which was a large mining company called BHP Billiton, a FTSE 50 business, was coming out of that business and discovering that actually not all companies had lots of money. 
So when I'd work there, I would put forward a business case for doing something, it would get signed off, we'd go and do it, we'd move on to the next thing, we'd implement a fast track programme, we'd do a leadership development programme, and all of these things the company just did, because it was in a good place, it was making money, it was a responsible employer, and that was how it was. I moved from BHP Billiton to a waste management business called CleanAway. Shock to the system, my goodness me, it was like moving from a large, lovely corporate to a really tough, nitty-gritty, low-margin competitive business. And I found very quickly there that I had to build a business case for every single thing I wanted to do. Everyone would agree a fast-track programme was the right thing, but they would say, what's it going to cost us? What's the return going to be? How are we going to know it's money well invested? And why should we invest it there and not invest it somewhere else? So I think it's really important that at the start you think about what's your business case? What are you trying to do? What are the objectives of the project? So if it's a fast track program, what's it going to achieve? What are the metrics by which you're going to know it's been successful or not? Because that's critical. If you don't set them out up front, how do you know that you've hit them at the back end? Think about what the investment's going to mean and demonstrate that it's either cost neutral or it's going to give a quality return. Articulate the benefits, so it might not be purely financial benefits. If you're building a business case to put an HR system in, everyone knows that's going to speed things up, it's going to be more effective and efficient, it's going to allow you to have better data, as well as hopefully take out some headcount cost in your admin team. And then finally, at the back end of it, which is a bit often people forget, measure your success. The thing we're not very good at doing in HR is celebrating our own successes. Um, and I think you need to do that when you've delivered a project. Shout it from the rooftops, you know, we said we were going to do this and we've done it. And, and keep on measuring that success and continually improving it. So I think if you can do that, if you're going to be a commercial HR director or a commercial business partner, thinking about these significant steps and demonstrating ROI is critical. And I think there are some mistakes to avoid as well. Um, You've got to make sure that you plan it properly. Um, and I think this was touched on earlier. You also need to make sure it's accurate. Now, I've seen a lot of um, cases fall down when the data, the financials, the numbers haven't stacked up. As I said before, if you're not good at it, if you're not numerate, find someone who is. If HR hasn't got the capability, speak to finance. You need to have somebody building business cases with you and for you who is numerate because you'll be challenged on the return, you'll be challenged on the spend, and you'll be challenged on what's going to be needed in terms of going to the central column or going into the P&L. So you've really got to get the data piece right. Also make sure you're measuring the right thing. And I would also always encourage you to have a quality and a quantitative judgment or measure. So what's it going to deliver, but what's it going to improve? And I think having those two things is always helpful. If you've only got one or the other, you probably haven't done enough work on the base case. Another common thing is measuring reaction, not the learning or the outcomes. My pet hate are these happy sheets that you get at the end of a day out. You go on a course and they say, did you enjoy it? Oh, yes. How was the food and the economy? Oh, it was lovely. How were the presentations? Oh, they were great. You know, you take someone out of the business for a day or two and you ask them to fill in a happy sheet, they're very seldom going to say, it was dreadful and I'm not happy. So you should be focusing on measuring the learning or the outcomes, not the reaction. And that's quite tough. I think the other thing is make sure it's business critical. If it's not a relevant project for your business, no benefit, no consequence, they're not going to want to do it. Another thing that I think is really helpful is using a control group. And uh, it was alluded to earlier by Ted that it's critical to think about doing trial periods or trial projects. Very similar, I think, uh, philosophy here. If you're trialling something new, take the old and establish how that was done and measure it. Take the new and establish how that was done and measure it and then compare the two. That way you can prove beyond any question whether it's cheaper, faster, better, etc. So just some mistakes to avoid. Um, you really are looking for things like concrete reductions, concrete improvements. You're looking for things that will actually deliver some value to the business. A good example in SIG at the moment is we're going into a broader sales proposition. And we're going to be selling across parts of the value chain that we haven't sold before. And we're going to be selling in an integrated way. So the business case that I built for doing extensive training with the sales team was looking at what we currently sell what the profitability will move to in the terms of what we're going to sell, and then taking a percentage of that to spend on the programme. I got it signed off like that. 
So it's about thinking about the return on the investment. And I think as well, think about the ROI process at the back end, you'll definitely fail. If you haven't built this up front, by the time you present it to your boss, your boss's boss and their boss, then you'll be, um, you'll be definitely, um, you just won't manage to get it through. Last section from me very quickly is on effective use of benchmarks. Um, and I think, you know, I'm just putting up some examples here. But actually, benchmarks are critical and they can be really helpful to you. If you can use external benchmarks to support the business case for investment or internal benchmarks, they can really help. An example that I can give you when I went into, um, again, SIG, but in previous businesses, is the ratio of HR people to the business. If you can show that other FTSE 250 businesses have double the amount of people that you've got, then that helps you build your case for more resource. An issue I can, uh, an example I can give you outside of HR, our IT director went for more funding in SIG, and he looked back over the five year period before he joined, and he discovered that our spend on IT over that period had been 0.7% of our total revenue. That might be meaningless to you, but if I tell you the average spend is 2.5% of a company's total revenue, you can see that he'd a strong case for saying that we had been under investing in IT. So some examples there, Use metrics, use data, and use benchmarks. Choose the right ones because it will be different depending on the circumstances. Choose the ones that are appropriate to build your business case, but, but, but benchmarks can be really, really helpful. So to summarize, I think it's all about knowing your business, thinking about being prepared and anticipating what's going to come down the track, using data and analytics to demonstrate your business case, and I think the key thing that I would talk about here is show the value. It's very easy to talk about the what, but actually what you're looking at is the why. People know that the solutions you're going to propose are the right technical solutions. They know that what you're pushing forwards will be the appropriate thing for what they need, but they need to know why it's the right thing to do. Demonstrate the value. And the other thing is, you know, be bold. Have the courage of your convictions. We're often a little bit timid about putting things forward. But if you've got your preparation right, if your business case is strong, if you know the commercial value you're going to bring, then be bold. Why wouldn't you be in a position to have the courage of your convictions and be bold? So I think it's up to us, really. I think HR can have huge influence. I think we can be really strong and trusted, credible business partners. I think we can really show impact with quantifiable results. And I think if we can do all of this, then the future for HR is extremely bright indeed. Thank you very much.